Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. We're excited you're all here. <laughs> so um, thank you for joining us for tonight's live stream, Spiders, Venomous, Hairy, Lots of Legs, What's Not to Like with Dr. Sandra Brentley. My name is Kristen O'Hara. I am Director of Interpretation at Pajarito Environmental Education Center, or as we lovingly know it, PEAK, um, located in Los Alamos, New Mexico. I will be the moderator for tonight's program. Currently, the Los Alamos Nature Center, which is where PEAK is housed, <laughs> is closed. But we still have lots of ways you can interact and connect with nature. Check the PEAK website, peak, P-E-E-C, nature.org, um, for more live stream presentations and other happenings. And we can't start any program without giving a huge shout out to our wonderful members and donors out there. Your generous support gives us the ability to offer programs at this time. Thank you so much. If you are interested and you're not quite yet a donor, please visit our website. Again, that's peaknature.org to learn more. So um, before we get started into our presentation, a little about Dr. Sandra Brantley. This is her bio, so it's her words. Um, she says, I am a retired biologist from UNM, although you never really retire from biology. I, work with the I worked with the Museum of Southwestern Biology as a senior collection manager and also on research contracts. My interest in spiders and insects got goes back, back a long way to childhood, along with the usual picking up of rock shells and flowers. I was fortunate that my parents always supported me, even though they were a little disappointed that I didn't grow out of this interest <laughs> and do something more marketable. I also have a liberal arts background as a language major before I re returned to grad school in biology. So Sandra, I'm going to make you co-host and we will give the presentation, to give um, the floor over to you. Thank you everybody and I hope you enjoy the program. Okay, we'll see if I can make this work. <laughs> yeah, you should be able to now. All right, it looks fine. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming tonight to talk about many people's least favorite group of animals. Uh, tonight, I wanted to talk a little bit about spiders and touch on four areas. One is putting spiders kind of in the context with other arachnids, so the whole arachnid group, just briefly and then spend most of the time talking about silk, which is of extreme importance to spiders. And then near the end, um, Kristen had asked me to talk a little bit about some research projects that I've worked on. And then after that, um, I was gonna talk about some common questions about what I call the usual suspects, being widows and recluses and that sort of thing. And that I was hoping would then lead into a more open time for you all for you all to ask me questions as well. So with that, um, I will start by saying, you know, who, who are the arachnids? So this sort of motley crew, this is not all the groups, but it's many of them. These are invertebrate animals with eight legs, eight eyes, usually sometimes fewer. Uh, structures called pedipalps, which are the pinchers and scorpions and vinegaroons, and they haven't, uh, they're more like finger like appendages on the spiders, and they're these longer appendages on the solifuges. The harvestman picture and the mite picture here, they have pedipalps, you just can't see them in the, in the picture. So they're put together, these groups are put together a little differently, quite a bit differently actually, from insects. And as a group, they're really quite old. Um, probably even Precambrian, the scorpions are, have quite an old lineage. The spiders go back, you know, say 300 million years. So this is a group that's been around for a long time, has seen a lot of changes and is still with us. So what do they do in nature? They are generalist predators, meaning they catch and kill um, pretty much whatever they can, uh, and most are solitary. 
Um, for some of you, the idea of social spiders is maybe kind of creepy, but there are a few. There's about 30 species out of the 48,000 or so uh, spider species that we know of. Um, but although these guys are mostly eating other insects and other arthropods, uh, they, are, they themselves are prey for larger animals like birds and small mammals. So they're sort of right in the middle of food webs, um, having an influence both above at higher levels and at lower levels. This picture, um, as it says, is a condensed uh, view of the kinds of places and, and a little bit about the kinds of webs and burrows that you will find spiders in. And if they were packed in this tight, I think we would all be, we would have a tough time. We'd be covered in silk all the time, essentially. But from this, you can see that the spiders do this sort of traditional orb web. Um, they hunt on the ground. They make uh, different kinds of burrows with different kinds of trapdoors. Uh, they hunt up in, um, in vegetation. This bolus spider here makes a, hangs on to a single line and throws a sticky glob of glue, silk glue, out at moths uh, to catch them. So there's, these, these animals have a lot of different ways of interacting with their environment, and we'll talk about, um, we'll talk about some of those. Ah, this is your Halloween cartoon. No spider person is without her far side cartoons. So in this, sad to say, this is probably one direction the silk would not just come out and pile up on the ground, but it's, it's a great, great cartoon anyway. And is my uh, transition to talking about spider silk and its uses. So the silks are proteins. They're in the fibroin group, and there may be up to eight types. Then different spiders will use the subset that they need that best fits their lifestyle or their life stages. So, um, and some examples down here are of dragline, and you have all seen dragline. Spiders play out a line of silk pretty much everywhere they go. And that's, you sometimes if you look out in the morning through, you know, if you've got flowers or shrubs or something out and you see these sort of random, um, lines of silk, and you're, you're thinking, what happened here? Where's the web? Where's the spider? It was just passing through and may, may be long gone, but they play this out um, all the time. It, it helps them, they stick it to surfaces periodically, and so you, as you know, when the spider falls off a table or drops out of a shrub or falls off the ceiling or something in front of your face, and then it can climb, it climbs right back up on its drag line, so that's a, a protection for it. Um, the main purpose that for, for silk, as, as much as the, the way we pay attention to it, is in making webs. And they may need up to four different kinds of silk in order to make a single web, and that is true of the orb web. But they also have a separate kind of silk to wrap up prey, a separate kind of silk to make the egg sac that protects the eggs. Um, and they use silk also for dispersal and getting to new locations. So when immature stages are ready to separate from each other and from mom, they, they do something called ballooning, uh, which helps get them into new habitats. And we'll talk about that a bit, all of these, um, a little bit more. So this rather busy drawing, uh, but it's also, it's a great time for me to give a shout out for everybody who's into technical illustration. We would be lost without those people. So the people who can do these drawings are fine by us. <laughs> so in this case, the spider, which is one that a former grad student worked on, that's uh, Tangela radiata here, is a good example of the kinds of structures that most spiders have. So different from insects and having only the two body parts. And I don't want to do that. Um, two body parts, the eight legs, the pedipalps that you can see here, 
And the spinnerets, all right, you're going to persist in showing me that. Um, the spinnerets are at the back of the abdomen of the spider. And sometimes if you're looking down on it from the top, you can see them sticking out a little bit, um, but not always. And if you were to turn the spider over, this is what the spinnerets would look like. There are usually six of them, as you can see them more clearly down here in this drawing. Um, there used to be eight uh, because of the eight things with arachnids. There are now six for the most part. And at the ends of the spinnerets are tiny, tiny, tiny little spigots. And from the spigot comes the silk strands. And so what we see is a line of silk is actually a whole bunch of very, very, very tiny fibers all pulled together. The fibers, um, well, the silk glands are in the abdomen. Um, the silk is a liquid until it's pulled from the body and it then dries um, into a fiber that becomes really stretchy and strong. So it's, uh, this is their main toolkit. So this is how they, they get through much of life. And this is a scanning electron micrograph. If you were looking down on, actually on Tangela, this is again from a grad student, former grad student, Rachel Malice. Um, but this is the real, the real deal. You can see, you know, spiders are just so very hairy. <laughs> um, but you can see the six spinnerets here. And on the larger ones, you can see these, all these little spigots on the inside. And this is actually, those are pictures of spigots themselves. So these are really, really magnified, um, but they show a real wealth of um, micro or even ultra structure in the way that uh, they are put together. Um, and I guess I should say by way of magnification, if you want to work at identifying spiders at any even at genus level and certainly at species level, you really need um, a stereoscope and um, some magnification to do that. So it's, they are not necessarily easy to identify. You need adults to be able to do that. And um, we actually spend a lot of time looking at features on the genitalia in order to be able to make an ID. To use the technical term, those would be the naughty bits. So, um, since we've talked some about these different kinds of silks, I uh, wanted to share with you some of the web designs that spiders use. Certainly the orb web is the main one that we think of. And uh, the example that I have here is of our cat face spider or a pumpkin spider, it's called, Uranius illodatus. And I like this picture because it makes the legs look really spiny. I mean, they are, but you can really see it here, and that really bothers a lot of people, unfortunately. Um, in order to make this orb web, the spider needs silk that makes these frame threads around the outside, and it also makes the radials or the spokes. And it uses another kind of silk for some temporary scaffolding while it's putting all this together, and then it takes that up later. So that's two kinds of silk. The third kind is the kind that makes the spiral around those spokes. And the fourth kind makes sticky droplets of, 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 of silk that make the, the web as a whole sticky to catch prey. So four kinds of silk. The spider spends most of his time, at least during the day, up here in a retreat for safety. Most spiders are nocturnal, although not all of them are. Some of them are active by day. So this web is pretty simple and it's very flat and clean and the spider takes it down every day or two and remakes it because its clean appearance is important to it being kind of invisible to prey. So uh, the spider can eat the silk, recycle the proteins, and then make another web. So by uh, comparison, the space web or tangle web that the widows here, Latrodectus and Steatota, which are often called false widows, 
Um, this web looks like uh, a random mess of silk threads, but there is method to the madness here. The, the threads in the middle are um, not particularly sticky, but they are a tangled up mess and that if a, an insect gets caught in there, it really can't get away out very well. But in addition, what makes this web particularly interesting too is that the, at the bottom, these strands do have sticky globules at the bottom and they're, they're stuck down to the substrate um, under tension so that any, uh, an insect coming across one of these all on the ground will break it, get caught in it, and get snapped up into the tangled uh, mess above it. So there's really, this is, a uh, looks messy. The widows tend to add to it. They don't take it down and rebuild it very often, um, but it's very effective for what they need to do. And since widows are so common here, if you notice, very often, not always, but very often they are building close to the ground or they're in places where they have uh, lots of um, spots where they can attach the silk um, the framework. So in my case, they're all over like my prickly pear beds and that sort of thing. For the, um, for the orb web, if the spider is very large, they need a big open space to do this. And so they tend to be um, building the frame in uh, from like a tree limb to the ground or in a window frame or that kind of thing where they have a lot of open space. So these two styles are really different, um, but both very effective. And some other example, no, don't do that. Do not do that. <laughs> do not do that. My apologies. Um, some other kinds of webs are sheet webs, and they are not sticky. The grass spider, the agilinids, um, hang out in the funnel towards the back, and then they have this big sheet in front that tangles up prey, and the spider is amazingly fast at roaring out of that funnel, grabbing the prey item, and taking itself right back into the funnel. It happens, happens very quickly. The other uh, web here is a linophead web, which are the line weaving spiders. They tend to be quite small in body, uh, body size. The, this one, the bowl and doily spider is a common example. And now you're seeing some features that we've seen before, right? You see, you see these knockdown threads up top. Um, uh, I'm not controlling this well. The spider itself hangs out under in between the bowl and the doily. And so it's well protected. And any insect uh, flying that gets knocked down into the bowl, the spider can reach up from underneath and pull it through and yet be, and, but still have its own protection. So these are some other ways of, common ways of doing, of making webs. And I wanted to just touch on two modified webs, which are, really kind of fun. The ogre-faced spider, which has these enormous eyes, um, it is strongly nocturnal and its night vision is very, very good with these big eyes. Um, it hangs from uh, like a branch in a shrub. So it's hanging down over the head first, down over the ground, and it's made a sort of net that it's holding in its first two pair of legs. So see, this is when it's good to have a lot of legs because you got legs holding you, uh, holding the branch, you got legs holding the web, and you got, you know, stabilizing your other pair of legs. It's very handy. So with this web, the spider is hanging over the ground, and when uh, a prey item goes by, it can drop down. Those legs are very long, so it extend its legs, wrap the prey item up in that silk net, and go back up into the vegetation. Um, without uh, leaving, you know, you can't tell that it was even there. So my guess for that word of advice is to watch, um, look up sometimes. <laughs> spiders aren't always on the ground. Uh, and the last spider web example is Hiptiotes, which is a great name. 
which is the triangle spider, which makes only that kind of pie-shaped wedge of an orb web. And it's, um, and it is actually part of the web itself. The body, the back legs are holding on to say the branch or a stem and the front legs are hanging on to like this line, the spider would be like right here. It's quite small. And the spider's holding that um, section of web under tension. So you're seeing a common pattern here of how these spiders hunt. So if anything hits this web, then the spider releases the tension and the silk uh, wraps around the prey item and they can just reel it in. So there, there are a lot of different designs. The spiders are, have about 120 families. So groups are not necessarily that closely related to each other. And they've come up with all these ways of uh, managing in their environment and kind of carving up niches in the environment that they can live in. But these egg sacs are, use another kind of silk uh, that's quite tough that, uh, because spiders, for the most part, are laying their eggs to overwinter and the adults usually die. Uh, at the top here, you can see a nursery web spider who's carrying her eggs um, in her fangs um, underneath her body. And the wolf spiders carry their egg sacs attached to their spinnerets and drag them around behind them. Both of them have a certain amount of maternal care that they provide to spiderlings. Uh, but oftentimes uh, they don't, spiders don't do that. And so they have to make a tough egg sac to fit into niches that are safe, they hope, for um, a hatching of, of baby spiders. They need to be protected from parasitoids uh, and from mold and, and other kinds of path pathogens. So that's a separate, separate silk type for them. And then for dispersal, we talk about um, ballooning. And it's great, the spiders that do this balloon through the air are called aeronauts. Uh, they're not flying under their own power, but what they do with a, a, a light breeze and um, a bit of silk is extruded from the abdomen. And then when it gets long enough to match the weight of the spider, the spider can let go of whatever it's been holding onto and float away in the air. And we've just found out recently that the silk has a slightly different electric charge from the atmosphere around it. So that also helps um, make them become airborne. And so small spiders throughout their lives can balloon and the immature stages, which are small, uh, also balloon and the effect can be pretty ridiculous. Um, this is a whole bunch of spiders that wind currents took them right into this farmer's fence and just draped all those fence posts with silk. So that very many spiders can do this often in the fall um, and in the more northern parts of the country uh, you can you can get a level of, of spiders that can produce that kind of webbing. But for all of that talk about webs, there are actually more species of spiders that don't make them than, than do. And so these wandering spiders can be um, almost anywhere. So if, if you are someone who doesn't really like spiders that much, at least if you think about them in a web, you know where they are. The wandering spiders, you don't necessarily know where they are. So <laughs> because they move around. Some examples here are the uh, ghost spiders, the anaphenidae, uh, the crab spiders, which are often on flowers or underneath flowers, and they can change colors to match the petal color. And they are great ambush hunters of flies and bees that come to uh, flowers to pollinate them. Um, butterflies too, for that matter. So if you sometimes you see an insect that's sort of sitting on a flower, but at a, a rather funny angle and not moving, if you look under there, sometimes there's a crab spider that has nailed it from underneath. And also the lynx spider, <clears throat> these green ones are pretty, pretty well camouflaged. This one's on the milkweed. Um, very, very spiky legs. So if, 
the, the spiders that most people think of as wandering spiders that are really, really common are the wolf spiders with very characteristic face, large eyes, and their second row of eyes, um, and the jumping spiders, which also have large eyes in their first row of eyes. And they are exactly, the jumping spiders are indeed looking back at the person taking the picture. Their vision is extremely good. Uh, they're uh, visual daytime hunters relying on stealth. They sneak up on things and then pounce on them. And um, they are pretty bold. They're not particularly dangerous, but all of these, because they're predators, have to have a certain amount of assertiveness, I guess I would say. The jumping spiders are um, the second largest family of spiders in the world, and they're especially numerous in the tropics. So there's plenty of stuff. These are being described new ones all the time. I just got a a paper from a colleague who described a new one from South America. So they're, you know, it's not like we know all of them by any means. So Kristen had asked that I talk um, just for a minute about a couple of projects that that I have worked on. And this picture is with my colleague Mike Draney. And we were down in the Sacramento Mountains. He's he's from the Las Cruces area and is now a professor up at Green Bay, Wisconsin. And so you see us with our toolkits out there um, sampling spiders in the forest from, uh, from the ground, from vegetation, and Mike is holding a brush in his, in his left hand for uh, sweeping tree trunks because there are spiders that spend a lot of time hanging out there. So you can imagine what we look like to passersby. But one of the one of the projects that I wanted to mention um, involves a spider in the genus wolf spider, Pardosa, and particularly Pardosa orophila, which means mountain loving. This one is distincta. The picture is distincta, but it's in the same group. And it's found in pinyon juniper and ponderosa pine habitat. And a project that I worked on. Um, had really just a small part in, was uh, working on a kind of conservation of spiders. And this was used as an example within the Colorado Plateau, which is in the, or the yellow um, oval here. And within that, um, we looked at habitat where this spider occurs and then modeled with climate change what that might look like by 2080. So the color the red means that the spider occurs there now, but will likely not be there in 2080, and that's a lot of habitat lost. The purple is habitat that will continue, and the blue is some new habitat that would open up under climate change, but the blue and the purple do not outweigh the red, and so spiders are useful in the way that pollinators and butterflies um, are also in monitoring climate change and how species are, are being forced to move, if they can, from uh, places where they are normally found. The more recent project that I've been working on has been in Ponderosa Pine Forest um, at the Valles Caldera, which had this nice open woodland for a while. Fire is certainly part of the normal history of these kinds of woodlands, but this is a result in 2011 from Las Conchas that was a stand replacing a really catastrophic fire in the Ponderosa Pine, and which now looks something like this. It's coming back to annual plants and grasses. The dead tree trunks are slowly falling. Uh, this particular picture shows um, the elk fencing that we used around the pitfall traps that we had down here is one. So we were, we were collecting ground active arthropods, of which I did the spiders. Oh man, this is jumping like crazy. 
I promise you I am not touching it. <laughs> um, so anyway, the, what's happened by 2015, we have monitored spiders for, from 2011 to 2015, along with a lot of, a lot of insects, a lot of large animals, um, obviously the vegetation and soils. Uh, this has been part of a large integrated project looking at the effects of Las Conchas on, uh, on the environment. So I have just one data slide. Um, which shows that this analysis separates how closely related ab the abundance of spiders and some of the species were if they were found on burn sites or unburned sites. So the burn sites are darker and all grouped together. The unburned sites, those spiders were um, a little more scattered and but pretty well separated from the burned. And that is that was you know four and a half years after the fire. We still don't see that the spiders are coming back uh, to any original so-called original uh, pre-burn condition. But you can see from the pictures here that neither has the environment, and the spiders have noticed. They are fussy about their habitat choices, and they can sometimes make do with microhabitats within. Uh, larger uh, habitats like forest or uh, shrubland or something, but this is this was such a radical change that it caused quite a turnover of species. And now uh, uh, this is my usual suspects. These are the groups that I get most questions about: um, tarantulas. Uh, black widows, and then there'll be another couple of slides. Um, our tarantulas here are not particularly dangerous. It's not like they're South American bird spiders. Um, they're large, they're really shy, their vision's awful. Uh, so you may think that they're coming for you, but they they probably can't see you. <laughs> so they're, in, they're very, very hairy and sensitive to vibration and uh, surface structures and that sort of thing. So the ones that you see out in the summertime and into the fall are usually adult males, and that takes about seven years to reach adulthood, um, who are out looking for females to mate with. The females stick pretty close to home. They're either in the burrow or within a few meters of it, and the males, part of their behavior as adults is to spend a lot of time walking around trying to find them. So sometimes people bring tarantulas and say, oh, I found one, do you want it as a pet? And it's like, gosh, you know, doing that to a male tarantula whose one goal is to walk until he finds a female, it's like putting him in a cage is not a good thing. So um, our tarantulas are hard to identify. There are several species in the state. They all look essentially like the picture. And even though they're big, uh, a lot of their structures are quite similar looking. Um, and the black widows, I'm sure you all know, that are common as dirt around here. We have lots of them. The female at the bottom here is in her web, upside down, doing, being the, the female widow that she is, the male in the upper picture is not black. He's maintained the coloring of the immature stages. So the only thing that's black about the black widow is the adult female. Um, and that is often a surprise to people. The male is also quite a bit smaller than the female. The brown recluse, I get asked about a fair amount um, because it has so much bad press. Um, we don't have it commonly here in the state at all. It is found, I have some specimens from down around Roswell and there are some down around uh, Las Cruces, but for the most part, as you can see in this map here, reclusa itself, the species, is found to, uh, for much prefers being in a warmer and more humid climate. So, I mean, Missouri, Arkansas, like that's perfect. 
out here it's probably a little too high and dry and cold for it but i am always interested if people have a recluse or think that they have a recluse to let me know i'm not going to say flat out that it doesn't that it's not here because we do have a few here i have collected apachia which is in new mexico i have never seen it in uh, buildings at all it's always been out in the field so the spider that gets in trouble for looking like the brown recluse is this, is the cellar spider, which is not related to it. Um, these are also very common. Uh, they prey on other spiders for the most part, and that would include black widows. And so very often around garages and outbuildings and that sort of thing where you have widows, you also have cellar spiders, but they are not recluses. So um, I wanted to make sure to put up both of these pictures for comparison here. Although I realize that a lot of people don't want to um, spend a lot of time looking at any of this stuff up close. But I can see where they're similar, but they really are, um, they're really quite different. And as a, kind of as a wrap up, here are some references for you, and I can leave this list with Kristen. Um, Rich Bradley's Common Spiders of North America is a fairly large field guide uh, with lots of illustrations. And Bug Guide uh, on the web is a resource for all kinds of arthropods. So all the invertebrates with six legs or more, so insects and arachnids, millipedes, centipedes, all of those are often photographed on Bug Guide. Um, it's a good place to look up pictures. Um, Herb and Lorna Levy, back in 1968, wrote Spiders in Their Kin, which was one of the little golden guides, which is a complete classic. It's still out there. It's small, it's portable, and it's a great way to break into uh, some of these groups if you're interested in them. Um, Norm Platnick, who died just this year, suddenly, um, had just put out Spiders of the World, A Natural History. And um, that introduces many of the world's families because we certainly don't have all the families here. And Rick Vetter um, is known for studying spiders of medical importance. He's the contact between a lot of the physicians in general um, and spider information. He is retired from the University of California at Riverside. So that is his website. He also, as this is the time for handing out Nobel Prizes, he is a winner of this year's Ig Nobel Prize in entomology, which is um, a prize for the Ig Nobels are for scientific articles, usually of a lighter nature that are kind of fun, but then they stop and make you think. And Rick won for his article on entomologists who are afraid of spiders. And so with that, I am going to close with peacock spiders, which are from Australia. They are tiny and they are just gorgeous. They are little jewels. Their mating, um, their courtship dances are readily accessible um, online and they're, they're just hilarious to watch. They're Amazing. Uh, Jorgen Otto is there, discovered the genus and um, has done quite a lot of the work on them. And so that wraps me up right there. So I'm going to stop the share. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so we have several questions, including one from some from myself, because I'm curious. Um, I think it was your, I, I'm fascinated by spiders <laughs> now. <laughs> um, so, um, so we have a lot coming in. Give me one second. No, sure. No worries. That, that, that's kind of what I was hoping for. Yeah, yeah me too. Yeah, I have some um, so um, if you 
feel like you want to turn your video, you can now, Sandra, or you can leave it off. It's up to you. Um, I can't. Oh, I can do it. I got you. <laughs> Actually, I don't mind being off, but that's okay. Oh, oh yeah, no, we'll leave no, it off. It would no, no. It, that's hardly <laughs> that's hardly fair. Mm -hmm. Um, stop video. I forced you. I'm sorry. No, sorry. There. We okay. Go. Hey. Perfect. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, so we have first one was um Kay saying, "Hey, she's excited to hear you speak." And then, um, that was beforehand, we have Lori asking on the burned, non-burned plot, yep. what are the union, units on the axis? Ah, okay, I was trying not to do that to you, but <laughs> okay, <laughs> that was a, a way of visualizing an analysis that took into account species and their abundances on those two axes. So it was a non-metric non multi-dimensional scaling, an NMDS plot um, <clears throat> that on the first axis was giving you separation by the burned and unburned. The second axis was based more on season. There was a lot more scatter in the unburned stuff, uh, which mm -hmm. was due to seasonal differences, particularly fall, fall numbers. Um, that we weren't seeing so much in the burned group. Okay, cool, if awesome. If you want to pull up your PowerPoint at any point too, you are your co-host still, so feel free. Um, so we also have, let's see, a lot of them coming in. Um, is only the adult female black widow poisonous or is the male and juveniles also poisonous? The whole lot, I mean, virtually all spiders are venomous, um, in, and that would include all of them in the widow, the, all the life stages in the widow as well. So that group um, is, not all of them have been tested. It's not a very big genus, but there are a bunch of species, and obviously the juveniles are small, the male is also small, and um, I don't know that there have been that many occurrences of bites from the males. Mm -hmm. um, it usually seems to be more the female because she's built a web someplace that <clears throat> if it's near you, if it's in the garage or a storage shed or a wood pile or something, it's because you made a nice habitat for her. And if you keep it disturbed, if you keep stuff moved around, um, they, because they add to their web over time, unlike the orb weaver, that they would, um, then that kind of encourages them to move on. Hmm. So, okay. Um, so keep moving stuff around if you have black widow spaces. Don't have a wood pile like next to the house, and, you know, and it, and because it's fall, and so a lot of these guys are are starting to move into houses now. Yeah. You know, this, this is a great time for me. I get all these calls with people saying, you know, why is all this stuff suddenly inside my house? Yes. <laughs> because it's warmer. Um, so um, most of these animals that we've been talking about are not, don't live more than a year or two anyway. The tarantulas are a major exception there um, by living 20 years or so. Yeah. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. The females can. So. Wow. Um, but for the most part, they're looking for a little protection. Um, you can either keep, I usually keep a couple of containers handy in a, in a drawer to usher them back outside, you know, that, and if you have that already kind of planned out, it, it's easier to do, then you don't have to run around and go, I don't have anything to move it with. <laughs> I don't recommend um, grabbing these guys. Um, that's the sort of thing that would encourage biting, and I think I think you would do, if something really big picked you up, I think you'd probably bite it too, if you could. So it, it's better to have some, a fairly large container that you can put it in that doesn't squeeze it and take it back outside. Okay. Okay, so um, what, that like answered all of my questions. Uh -oh. That's good. <laughs> um, what is your favorite spider? Oh dear. Mm. That is really, really hard to say. Um, 
because I, I hope I gave you all a little taste of how ingenious they are, how very many creative ways they have of living in the world. Right now, I am working on the Linophiids, that, that group that has the bold and doily spider. Um, they are tiny. They are on the order of two or three millimeters. They're really small and not very well known from the state. So I'm working on them. Um, the males often have really modified head shapes. The carapace can be, you know, pointed or lobed or, you know, they do all these other things to it. The eyes may be carried up the lobe. They may, they're, they're really um, an interesting group. They're, they are the second largest. They're right behind the jumping spiders, the second largest family of spiders in the world. So um, they are also better in kind of colder and wetter places, but we have them here. Okay, so cool. So right now they're your favorite. It's hard to pick a favorite, you know? <laughs> Fair but enough. I really like the ogre face spider. I'm like the a fan. Ogre face spider. <laughs> they're, they're more tropical, but yeah, they are. They look like they're frowning, you know? They do. They look a little, a little mad. Um, <laughs> so you hear about people getting spider bites around here. Yeah. Are they? What kind of spider is question mark? <laughs> that was, it's from Barbara. Uh, question, Barbara. Thank you. thank you for asking, are they? Because <laughs> is it true? People, many people will say, you bet they are. And it isn't clear that they are. Uh, that's something that Rick Vetter, my colleague out in California, works very hard to get people to understand that it isn't necessarily a spider that's caused the problem. And we always ask, although we know it's hard, or if you, know, if you think you've been bitten by a spider, get the spider. But you can't always, and we know that. But there are lots of other things that can bite you. Insects bite you. You can have some kind of like, you know, skin allergic reaction. Some, you know, who knows? Something that causes that kind of irritation. And spiders take the rap for a lot of that. And doctors are often just really happy to say, yep, spider bite. You know. And, right. So, um, so, so vilifying the spiders so sometimes it is most times it probably is not but um spiders usually will get well out of the way if they have even half a chance to do that so the problem usually comes up when you uh press up against it you know you roll over on it you grab it unintentionally when you're moving boxes in the garage that's the kind of thing that um where you kind of give it no choice but to bite. The, the venom is, is primarily to subdue prey. It is defensive, but they have to make it. So they wouldn't be just going around looking for people to bite for the heck of it, you know? Right. <laughs> um, then they might not have any when they come across a prey item. So they, they can use it all or a little or none. You know, it's, so it's, it's quite variable. Um, people's reactions are quite variable, and um, the whole thing is, it, the question is really hard to answer. Okay, cool. It's kind of like snakes, like snakes kind of get a bad rap. Or spiders and snakes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, this is from Claudette, and Claudette is asking, I think she might be referring to the brown recluse. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard the bite is powerful enough to take down a horse. Why so powerful? Um, why, yeah, why, is, why so powerful if it's prey so small? Well, the, as I said um, before, the spiders, the different families of spiders are not closely related to each other, and they've come up with their own venom cocktails. They are not targeting mammals, necessarily. We just happen to be susceptible to what the recluse makes. Um, it's not, I, I, you know, all of these groups are so old. They came up with all of this well before we showed up. Okay. Yeah, mammals, and, you know, mammals are an old group also, but it, it was, it is defensive, but it's mostly uh, prey capture. And I, I don't think the intent was to bring down anybody, you know, it was to bring down a, something small. To eat. Um, I'm allergic to bee and wasp venom. 
you know, they're not after me particularly, right. um, unless I get in the way. Uh, but, um, and I don't have a systemic reaction, but I have a really awful local reaction that takes about a week to go down. They're not targeting me. It's just me. That's right. my payback for <laughs> all the ones that I've worked on, I think. So, um, I think it was just kind of the luck of the draw. Most spiders are really not considered dangerous to people. We're, we're ta- out of 48,000 species, it's really only a handful that are particularly um, dangerous for us. That's good to know. That's okay. That makes a lot of sense. Like it wasn't meant to be, but it, wa- but it is. <laughs> it is, yeah, but it wasn't, you know. I, I it's not intentional. You know, and in their heads, they've got to keep track of what eight legs are doing, what eight eyes are doing, and be able to judge what the environment is doing. I mean, there's really no room left in there for malevolence against people. (laughs) 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 Um, What is the friendliest spider? (laughs) Probably there are not friendly ones. Um, Because they're solitary and, and predators, their interactions with, certainly with other arthropods, are more along the lines of, can I eat it? Is it going to eat me? And so they don't play in that sense. And very often, I think a lot of the courtship um, maneuvers that males do, whether it's if they're on webs, if they're plucking the female's web, or if they're doing a courtship dance, or something like that, is a way of saying, I'm not food. I'm a male Hmm. interested in mating. I'm not lunch. Wait a minute. (laughs) Just give me a chance. Give me a chance. You know, know, it's kind of like, have you ever seen your prey items do this? No. (laughs) I maybe not prey. Maybe I'm just male. So I think. (laughs) And then sometimes they get eaten anyways, right? Right. You know, so so um, friendliness is probably not something they. Are there more docile spiders then? Like. For instance, like daddy long legs, like you can, I don't know if that's their real name, but uh, they, they like will walk on you and it's fine. Or I've, I've seen people pick up black widows and move them outside just in their hand. So. Yeah, they, they are, for the most part, they'll get out of the way if they can and, and are not necessarily aggressive right away. The daddy long legs are harvestmen, which are another arachnid group. Okay. So they're not spiders, but they're. Um, and they're not venomous, but, um, so yeah, you can, they smell bad, but they don't, uh, they're not venomous. So, I mean, even things like, you know, the scorpions and vinegaroons and all those things are, they're very sensitive to air currents, um, to vibrations on the ground, and they will get out of the way if possible for something, you know, we must sound like T-Rex coming across the ground to them. You know, we are huge by so huge by their standards that definitely um i think they're like well that's too big i'm out of here cool this is actually that actually answered james's question he had a question about whether the male venomous uh, the male widow was venomous which we answered um yes and um whether cellar spiders and daddy long legs or the harvest spider Ah. are the same we have a problem um and that problem is common names um, the cellar spider is called a daddy long legs spider, but it is a spider. Oh, okay. The daddy mm-hmm. long legs that are harvestmen are not spiders. They are harvestmen, which is why I don't use the term daddy long legs if I can avoid it. Um, <laughs> Good to know. Okay. Yeah, cool. It, uh, it's, yeah, it's like, you know, what do you mean by daddy long legs? And people are like, what the heck? That's a common one. Right. <laughs> We're like, like, I don't know. <laughs> working, you know? Like, so there is a spider called that, and then there are the harvestmen called that. Okay, good to know. Um, how do I safely, for the spiders, very kind, very kind, Judy, move egg sacs out of my house? Is it possible? <laughs> Um, yeah, if you've got, if you've got egg sacs in your house, you can, you know, just detach them from wherever they're hanging and take them outside and just put them outside. Um, I would guess that 
for in the house, that's most likely to be widows or cellar spiders. And you can just move them outside. You know, I mean, the, the widows and the cellar spiders are really good at living with people, but they certainly didn't do that originally. So it's not like they can't live outdoors. Their egg sacs can overwinter. They're, you know, that's fine. They're not, um, they're certainly not domesticated. So, <laughs> so you can put them, you can move all that stuff outside. Is there a certain way to do it? Do you just sort of detach it and like it and put it in a corner? Yeah, <laughs> the widows, those widow egg sacs can have like a hundred eggs in them. So yeah, it, it's like you don't want to wait until they hatch because then you have tiny little brown baby widows like all over everywhere. No, okay, good call. Judy, yes, move, yes. It if a, <laughs> move it out if it's move it out. Um, it, are they the most common spiders that we would see here? Do you say widows? Um, what would be the most common one? This well, is they are asked. really common around habitation, you know, around where we live, for sure. The widows are, the western black widow is, is very common. Um, if you're out away from habitation, the, the, animal, the spiders that are on the ground that you're more likely to see are wolf spiders. So those are quite common and really numerous. Um, and you can often see them running around um, like on the forest floor with their little egg sac attached to their spinnerets, dragging it behind them. You see them running along, you know, with the egg sac bumping along over the pine needles and stuff. Um, they would be common. The, um, the ground spiders are common, but they're also pretty strongly nocturnal. So you don't usually see them at, unless you're out at night. Um, wool spiders are active at night, uh, also, and you can see eye shine with them if you take a flashlight with you. Okay. Um, crab spiders are pretty common um, if you look on flowers, um, and of course the orb weavers are up in vegetation. There are a lot of orb weavers. If you look low, the grass spiders are also pretty common. If you look for that sheet web with the funnel, they often get into shrubs or along kind of stony areas that have clumps of grass in them because they need a lot of places to hook the, the silk to. So that has, offers a lot of web attachment sites for them. And so they are also pretty common. So look when the light is low. So early morning or at, at dusk and you can, you'd be surprised, I think the number of webs you can, you can turn up. So it just sort of depends on where you are and mm -hmm. cool. Okay. Um, Let's see. Um, oh, Claudette meant the Black Widow. The Black Widow could take down a horse. It's just very uh, venomous. It doesn't mean to. The, the Black Widow, the, the venom is a neurotoxin, so it, it doesn't really, it works throughout the body. Um, usually, for, for people anyway, if you're an adult and reasonably healthy, you're probably not going to be killed by it. So it would be unlikely that it would, you know, kill, you know, an, an even bigger animal. Okay. But, but it is, yeah. it is systemic and um, it causes, you know, pretty severe muscle cramping and can uh, cramp your, then uh, that would include your diaphragm. So you would have trouble breathing. And so, you know, if you're in that kind of, of pain and, you know, then, if, or even if you think you've been hit by a widow like that, then yeah, get that taken care of. You know, don't just say, oh, well, it probably wasn't. And Sandy said they're not, <laughs> you know, Sandy said go to a doctor. <laughs> you're, you're, not a, you're not that kind of you're doctor. Sure. <laughs> um, one of my grad students actually has been bitten by a black widow. And um, he said, it's pretty awful. It was quite painful. Yikes. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, you. sometimes all that they need to do to, is like help you, you know, process the, the toxins and stuff and like help you breathe, you know, keep you like mechanically, you know, help you breathe and then you'll be okay. There is an antivenom also. So okay. Lots and lots of work done on the widows because, because they're so dangerous. They're so, yeah, venomous. Um, so Rennie asks, um, in the 70s growing up in Santa Fe, he would always see daddy long legs or 
the harvest moon <laughs> spider. Um, these days, I never see them. Are they disappearing? Um, what may be disappearing is, in some cases, is forest, or things are drying out. Uh, one of the, with that study on the, the Bayes caldera, I also looked at harvest moon there. And, I mean, they, in the mixed conifer forest, which burned, the harvest men were left with no trees, which they strongly prefer. Right. And their numbers went down by quite a bit. So dryness, I think, and, um, and loss of, of their preferred, like, micro sites within a habitat are probably at least part of the problem. We don't, the, the harvestmen back east or in California, I mean, or, or even like down in Texas, there's just like lots and lots of them. And I think because it's kind of dry here, we don't have as many. The ones that are here can do pretty well. You can get a lot of them, but they're not a lot of species. Okay. So I, 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 had, I had a colleague in Texas who, uh, who was from Texas who said that as a kid, what they would do is grab up a handful of harvestmen and throw them at girls. So, and then, of course. You're, of course, and then when they hit you, you know, I mean, the, the harvestmen go every which way over your head and down your shirt and down your sleeves. And yeah, you know, uh, but here I, I actually haven't seen a way that you could even get that many. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so as far as like knowledge about them actual just dis disappearing, is there articles out there or? Not that I know, you know. of. But, but those kinds of observations with people who have lived here a long time are, are important. Yeah, definitely. So thank you, Rennie. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, we've got some people that have wolf spires. <laughs> um, that big hogna carolinensis is... Are they really large here? This is yeah. coming from Ben. Are they, like, he says that he's seen them in Central America and they're very large. Oh, they How are. large are the ones here? Um, there's probably a couple of things going on. In, in Central America, there are wolf spiders, that family, but there are also the tenids, which is another family that look kind of like wolf spiders, and they're quite a bit bigger. So there's kind of a shift as you move south that the wolf spiders are replaced a little bit by this other family, which, is, which are a lot bigger and some of which are quite, are pretty dangerous. Oh, wow. How big are the ones here in, in New Mexico? I feel like I've seen some big ones. Uh, you know, the, <laughs> the, the Carolinensis is pretty good size wolf spider. It's mm -hmm. striped, it's grayish. The whole underside is black, if you can get a look at that. Um, and they are, I don't know, they're probably pushing an inch long. Oh, wow. Okay. So they're, they're, they're a hefty okay. spider. Yeah, and the males, the males for the most part have longer legs, especially legs one and two are longer in males um, and they have skinnier abdomens, but the females have bigger abdomens and, you know, I mean, they're, they're big. <laughs> right. They are, they are fairly large. Okay. And this is the time for them. Right. That's well, like I this. On my front, on my front door. I have no idea how I got there. Hmm. Cool. So you're more likely to see the larger spiders yeah. just in this time period. Yes. And that like the big orb weavers and that sort of thing. Those big adult females are, yeah, they're pretty big. And it's like, you know, they've been here all along. We just haven't noticed them because they've been small. That's fair. <laughs> yeah. So we have just a, a couple more and I know that we're a little over time. So, um, Do, do females lay only one sac before dying or numerous during their short life? Oh, they can lay numerous. Oh, Depends on the spider. Uh, Black widow, numerous. They may have more than one egg sac in a web at a time, even. So, wow. Yeah. So it really it varies with the spider, but um, certainly some of them can lay more than one egg sac in their lifetime. Some of them not. It also depends on how many matings they get. So 
it's uh, some of it is a uh, dependent on how much how many times they mate. Um, they can store sperm, so they they wait until they're ready to make an egg sac before they finish the fertilization and lay the eggs and all that stuff. So um, some of it depends then on the supply that they have to be able to fertilize them. Cool, spiders are so cool. I mean, oh man. Know, spider spider mating courtship is just, yeah, that's a whole other talk. <laughs> <laughs> because, um, but, go ahead, sorry. But yeah, so if, if, if you're hoping for one egg sac and that's it, no. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Check on that. Um, so two more. Matt asks, um, what is the most dangerous spider? And I guess like I would preface that by being like maybe like the most aggressive or like the most venomous and aggressive because that seems like it would be a bad combo. Oh, no, it's a um, bad Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, and it's, it kind of varies in Australia, the funnel the funnel web spider, which is not obviously like our grass spiders, that their funnel web is a, is a tarantula relative. And um, Atrax robustus. Atrax is the Latin that we get the word atrocious from. So uh, <laughs> robustus, you know, anyway. So yeah, that, that one is both, can be both aggressive and is pretty venomous. So that's one that's pretty bad. Another one is one of those tenants, one of the things that they call banana spiders uh, mm -hmm. from South America. The Funutria is considered uh, quite venomous. That, that, you know, almost to the, you get a good bite from that and you may not recover well. So, but <laughs> up here, up here, we're pretty lucky we don't have we don't have too much trouble, but there, um, I don't know that Flanutria, well, Flanutria will give you warning. A lot of spiders will raise their front legs, um, sometimes two pair of legs, and they're often in Flanutria, they're like brightly colored. Oh, wow. The, okay. That's the, I'm counting to 10 look. Right. Like I am obviously venomous. <laughs> it's, if you don't get that message, then. Right. And, and they're yeah they're big big leggy spiders so cool um, um are there so two more um what is your favorite kind of tarantula um and april says there's 17 new world tarantulas so what is your favorite <laughs> i actually don't work with much with tarantulas mm -hmm. so um one one of the recent um what we call a revision, because the tarantulas are so hard to identify, uh, that colleagues worked on those, and they found that several new species, and then they also found a bunch of separate species that turned out to be the, all the same thing. And so that means they had to, it's what's called syncing <laughs> or synonymizing. We, those got put back into one group, and then there were some new ones. But one that was kind of fun, that was new, was one that was a really pretty solid, black and velvety. And so the, the people doing the work named it, um, the species name they gave it was Johnny Cash Eye for the man in black. So that would probably be a favorite one at the cool. moment. Cool. <laughs> nice. Good name. So you can name, you can name a new species most anything you want except for yourself. Uh, April corrected me. She has 17 new worlds. <laughs> so she has all those tarantulas, which wow. is awesome, April. Good for you. It is, that is, yeah. And that, that's a bit of work. Yes. New, yeah. Feeding them and all. Um, so last question is from um, just, it says media. Um, are there spiders that live on Mount Everest? I don't know about living there, but the ballooning that we talked about earlier, um, spiders can be carried up really high, uh, even that high, into the air. So um, when the island of uh, Krakatau blew up in the 19th century, oh, no. one of the first sets of animals back were spiders, because they blew in. So. Cool. So there, yes, there are spiders at 
very high elevation. Um, and, and even, even with Everest, probably. I don't know how well they could manage. But I, I just read a paper. I just saw a master's thesis today studying uh, spiders and some other things in Denali. So looking at spiders in tundra, there's plenty of them. OK. They're good. It's high and cold. They're fine with that. <laughs> Adaptive creatures. Ah, they are. There's no escape. Ah. <laughs> I think they're great. <laughs> um, so that was all of our questions. Um, so I just wanted to thank um, you, of course, thank you. but also everyone, all the viewers um, that asked so many amazing questions and that tuned in tonight. Um, please remember to look out for that survey that's going to come your way in the next few days. Um, I'll make sure to give you that slide as well in that um, from Sandra. Yeah. If you are interested um, in having in, in attending another peak program, we have an astronomy program on Friday night at seven called Observing Mars at Opposition, which just means Mars is very close this time of year. And so it's really easy to see kind of all the cool landscape and, and interesting things about it. So they'll be talking about that. Um, for more information about our programs like that one, please visit our website again, peecnature.org, peaknature.org. And again, uh, Sandra, thank you so much for you. sharing your knowledge. It was amazing. <laughs> I just saw cool pictures of Pluto today, so. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Well, Mars, it might be up here. It in might Mars. be the, the um, next profession, right? Yeah, Mars is in, a, is, uh, in opposition. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Yeah. Well, awesome. Thank you so much. And I hope everyone has a great evening. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>